reactions from the cause of Great Britain. And a lot of the reaction was coming out of Belfast in Northern Ireland, a separate country, by the way, different from Ireland. And there, the protest from women was, why don't we have that? So there was a great groundswell in Northern Ireland, which is Protestant, for the same feature that had just entered into the Constitution of the Republic of Ireland. So that was a, a momentous thing, but we stood there, and uh, people were very peaceful. It was very calm. Even the deliberations on television uh, the, the evening before were calm and discussive rather than being confrontational uh, and angry. And, and I was much impressed with that, much impressed. The Irish, of course, have a reputation for being contentious, perhaps a little on the proud side, but you won't see that in me today. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Uh, the story of uh, the northern part of Ireland, uh, the, the background to it is this. <clears throat> in uh, 1601, the kingdoms of England and Scotland became one, Scotland now, because James I, who had been James V of uh, Scotland, comes to the English throne through one of those mischiefs of inheritance. The line diverts to the Stuarts. I spent a whole semester in graduate school studying the Stuarts. Well, enough said about that. <laughs> <laughs> James was, he, he's the one who inherited the uh, commission that was changing the Bible into English, creating a new Bible for English-speaking people. He had almost nothing to do with it except that he claimed the credit. That's, what it, that's the way it works with leaders, you know. The little guys <laughs> do the work and the leaders get the credit. Well, thank God, that never happens in the current administration. <laughs> uh, James' scheme uh, was to bring the two nations closer together under his rule, and uh, eventually, of course, Scotland would have its own uh, separate <coughs> parliament within, within uh, British uh, rule. But the space between England and Scotland was full of brigands, wild people, uh, robber barons they were called, people who controlled every pass and every <coughs> river through the country, and they charged for transmitting goods and people across that border. They held them up, in other words. They kidnapped people. They did all kinds of things. And James had the idea, reinforced by others, I'm sure, let's take these rowdy people and move them to Northern Ireland. This is what happened. They began uh, a plantation in Northern Ireland under James I uh, and encouraged relocation of Scots and others into Northern Ireland. The plantation goes uh, up in an area that has been uh, devastated by, by various wars and famines and ill government and so on. Uh, and so, but the bottom line is a lot of Catholic Irish people were displaced by the creation of what will become Northern Ireland or the plantation of Ulster. Uh, James was an idiot. <laughs> without, without much question, uh, there are not many defenders for the first uh, James. He was solidly Catholic, but when he became King of England, he became a staunch Anglican Catholic, that is, an Anglican, because that was the state religion of England, and he wanted Scotland to have the same uh, church, and Northern Ireland, and in fact all of Ireland, to be under the Church of England because it reinforced his status as king. He died, much to people's <laughs> satisfaction, and uh, he was succeeded by his son, who was, who'd been living in, in uh, all over the world, really, but he had grown up as a sort of playboy, and as often happens when playboys get into a position of power, 
They let the people who know how to do it, do it. They let the people in the administration of the government run the administration of the government. And for a time, they rocked the law. But he was a devout Catholic. He attended Catholic services. He had a number of mistresses. Uh, one of them was Mel Gwynn. Uh, uh, well, we'll get to that later. But the point is, England was in turmoil itself over the question of Catholicism versus Protestantism still, in spite of being uh, technically a Protestant country. Uh, Charles I did a lot of dumb things, too. Uh, it, it was like he had a committee thinking them up. How can I offend everybody? And by the 18, uh, 1640s, uh, he was demanding money out of Parliament, and Parliament wouldn't give it to him. And increasingly, Parliament was filling up with extreme Protestants who are known, were known then as Puritans. Puritans. Uh, the Puritans are actually Anglicans. They're just the ones who want to purify the Anglican church. But they've joined in their disaffection with the king uh, by all kinds of fragmented groups who are not Catholic. It's like a coalition of anti-Catholic forces. They take over Parliament eventually. Uh, the king uh, raises an army against his own people in the English Civil War follows. And so, for a time there, England is in great turmoil. The Puritans won the revolution. They galvanized this enormous army. They took the army to Ireland and proceeded to try to stamp out Catholicism and Irish resistance there. And most of Ireland was just really devastated and set back a century in terms of its uh, economic development. So this is where we sort of began our story. The people in Ulster or in Northern Ireland, I think, need some defining here. If we look back down into American history, jumping ahead for centuries, millions of Americans are of what's called sometimes Scots-Irish descent including many famous statesmen, soldiers, businessmen, business leaders. Andrew Jackson on the left here is one of those. Boy, this is one flattering picture. This is the one, I think, that hangs behind President Trump in his office, in the Oval Office. Now get that. I don't, I don't think he has anything but German ancestry, but that's, this is the man he's chose to model on or to say he models on. Um, on the other side is uh, President Woodrow Wilson, who was a Presbyterian, and many of the people who come from Scotland into Northern Ireland are Presbyterians initially. The reason, the reason they come uh, is because they're coming from these border areas to the, on the south side of Scotland. The Highland clans are Catholic. The Highland clans are Catholic. The people being moved into Northern Ireland are Protestants, for the most part, if they have a religion at all. Uh, that's President McKinley in the middle. He's the one who took donuts to the troops at Antietam. That, that was meant to be a joke. But that's literally what he did. He was, he was involved on the Yankees, uh, excuse me, the Union side. <coughs> Uh, Irish immigration to America, uh, as I said, came in two great waves, and the Irish influence in America will give rise to two great stereotypes that we're all familiar with. One stereotype is the Woodrow Wilson stereotype dating back to Andrew Jackson, is strong in the Democratic Party, strong in the South. Woodrow Wilson was a famous Presbyterian, and it's hard to make up a list of those folks. <laughs> I'm just kidding. I'm an Episcopalian, in case you wondered. What happened to me? 
My mother always said that. She was afraid to tell her mother. Afraid it might kill her on her hospital bed, you know. <laughs> they were all lifelong Baptists. He was the son of a Presbyterian minister and grew up in Stanton, Virginia, which is on the great wagon road that carried people immigrating to America, into Pennsylvania, down into the deep south. So he was sort of in the crosshairs. Uh, he's thought about as a very uh, puritanical in his perspective, uh, puritanical in his views, and uh, also international in his views. He's the man who thought up the idea of the League of Nations. Um, during World War I, he was our national leader. Uh, uh, President Wilson um, is remembered because he was unable to get the Treaty of Versailles signed by the United States, agreed to by the United States Senate, which means the United States continued in a state of legal war with Germany for years after World War I because the Senate would not approve the treaty. Interesting piece of uh, history here. When Woodrow Wilson left office, uh, excuse me, uh, let me back up, he was very ill. His wife uh, uh, nurtured him and uh, he had uh, taken a second wife during his presidency, which at one time would have been a no-no. But times are changing. We're into the 20th century, and, and Wilson marries a, a local haberdashery lady uh, from Washington, D.C., a very, fortunately, a very bright lady. He comes down with a, a stroke because of uh, his efforts to uh, get the treaty adopted, travels all over the country. Uh, and ultimately, he leaves the White House a broken man and joined the Episcopal Church. <laughs> I love it. Uh, and he is buried in the National Cathedral in Washington, D.C., which is, again, to all practical intent, an Episcopal Church. If you've ever been in there, you probably know what I'm saying. The other great tradition of the Irish in America, of course, is the John Kennedy, uh, the New England Irish uh, in the big cities, because many of the Irish who come in the 19th century are Catholic, and they gravitate toward the great cities of Boston, uh, New York, and other uh, big uh, ethnic centers. There's a map here uh, that shows the upper part of Ireland, the Ireland Island, the Emerald Isle, and it shows you which, which of the counties in Northern Ireland are part of this uh, plantation system. Well, why did these newly planted people who'd been in Northern Ireland for a hundred years begin to uh, change their interest and economic interest and move to another setting? Let's see if I can do this. Well, Northern Ireland is nominally um, part of all of Ireland being governed by the British. I got it figured out. You got it? Yeah. And um, what they discover is uh, in 1688, there's a revolution again in England, a more forceful expression of uh, Protestantism in England when William and Mary come over uh, to govern uh, Great Britain and, and England. And it was a problem. They were supposed to be Protestants, but they began persecuting the Presbyterians in Northern Ireland because they wouldn't conform to the English church. I told you this was complicated. And you can see certainly how it is. I'm trying to get it. Why is it not moving at all? And eventually the potato famine in the mid-19th century is going to disrupt the lives of the people living in all of Ireland, not just uh, Northern Ireland, and send people to America, um, as I said, who settle in the great cities. I cannot get it to advance to my, there we go. 
So at the time of the American Revolution, there's been a huge influx of uh, people, perhaps half a million. We don't know for sure because they didn't keep, uh, you know, transportation records and immigration records the way we do today, or try to today, I should say. But the Irish will play a huge role in the American Revolution, and in fact, uh, no lesser people than uh, General Cornwallis and General Washington on opposite sides both said the same things. The damned Irish have done it. They've stirred up this rebellion. They're the manpower in the revolution. And of course, uh, the American Revolution is won in the South, not in the North. Uh, I grew up with school books that were all about uh, Washington's maneuvers trying to neutralize the British movements in the New England colonies during the first part of the American Revolution. The British switched strategy on the Americans and tried to uh, move into the South, uh, tried to occupy Charleston, Savannah, uh, send an expedition deep into the heart of the South, and, and they did, and they were defeated, as you may know, at a place called Cowpens first, and then at uh, Kings Mountain, just over the border in North Carolina. That battle is critical in the revolution uh, from our point of view here because the, uh, over the mountain men who are fighting in it are largely cons uh, not conscripts but volunteers who came of their own accord to fight the British who had invaded the high country, the up country of North Carolina, what would be North Carolina. One of the things we misunderstand about uh, Georgia is that Georgia is filled up not from the s uh, south and the coast up, it's filled up through Augusta. And that's because of the great wagon road that carried immigrants from mostly Pennsylvania and Virginia, even North Carolina, down into Georgia after the American Revolution. If you were born in Georgia, the odds are very high that you're descended from one of these people who immigrated into Georgia from the upper colonies uh, after the American Revolution. There weren't that many people living in Georgia, less than 100,000 living in Georgia when the revolution ended. I thought I had a, a map of the Great Wagon Road, but it begins in Philadelphia, runs down through the valleys of Virginia, North Carolina, uh, and it ends in Augusta, Georgia. It doesn't end up here. People weren't moving, uh, not the Scots-Irish, not anybody else, moving into Georgia up in the up country. There's, uh, I don't know where this uh, got started, uh, but uh, the Scots-Irish are everywhere in Georgia. And the reason they are everywhere in Georgia is they were the principal population, I believe, of all the settlers who came into the earliest part of Georgia, which is the, the back country around Augusta. They, um, this suited their lives uh, well. Uh, and I've, in the, back in the 1980s, there was a huge push of trying to explain what this meant to the culture of the South. Uh, Grady McWhiney, who is a Mississippi, University of Mississippi professor, uh, wrote this book that I'm holding called Cracker Culture. And I wanted to read a couple of things from it because I think he accomplishes in you know, just a few words more than I can in an hour's talking. <coughs> The question is, what did the Celtic people bring to America in the 18th century? And he answers it this way. The Celts brought with them to the Old South leisurely ways that fostered idleness and gaiety, a society in which people favored the spoken word over the written word and enjoyed such sensual pleasures as drinking, smoking, fighting, gambling, fishing, hunting, and loafing. See, they're not all bad. <laughs> in Celtic Britain and in the antebellum South, family ties were much stronger than in England and in the antebellum North. Celts and Southerners, whose values were more agrarian than those of Englishmen and Northerners, 
wasted more time and consumed more liquor and tobacco and were less concerned with the useful and the material. Englishmen and Northerners who favored urban villages and nuclear families were just the opposite, imbued with the work ethic and commercial values. They were neater, cleaner, and wrote more, worked harder, and considered <coughs> themselves more progressive and a bit uppity. <laughs> Because we knew, we knew that part, right? The image here is uh, from a 19th century magazine uh, about 1850. And these are Georgia crackers. What is a cracker? A cracker refers uh, to the smart alecky, wise cracking Scots Irish migrants who've settled here from elsewhere. There's great tradition in Georgia that we all came from Virginia. That's only because Robert E. Lee came from there. Uh, actually, most of us were just itinerant wherever we were before we got to Georgia. We might have spent a, a generation in, in the Carolina backwoods or uh, later uh, moved into South Carolina or Georgia. So there's a great transfer of populations. If, if you're a, a member of um, one of the archaeological, uh, um, excuse me, um, um, these online uh, uh, genealogy programs, uh, you'll know one of the hardest things in the world is to track the migration of people. And uh, DNA is having some impact on that. But it's going to be another generation of scholars, another 20 years before we begin to have really clear patterns of immigration. So what I'm telling you here is mostly um, anecdotal and uh, you know, based on the commonality of names rather than uh, DNA. Let's see if I can get it to move. I don't know why it doesn't want to move. Come on. And here's the great wagon road at last, mostly from Philadelphia. Uh, there was greater tolerance for religious diversity in, in, uh, in uh, the Philadelphia. Uh, and in Pennsylvania. <clears throat> Many of the people who uh, hit the ground running there and moved to the frontiers of Pennsylvania are Scots-Irish people as well. And uh, the interesting thing, uh, story there is, after the revolution, the new federal government tried to impose laws on them taxing the manufacture of liquor. And they rose in rebellion for about five minutes. Uh, the president sent an army into the back country and that kind of cooled their ardor. They picked up and moved into Kentucky and started making whiskey there. It's uh, worth noting, in my opinion, it's worth noting, in my opinion, <coughs> that General Washington was the largest liquor distiller in the country. So people are flowing down into uh, this country Come on. I don't know why it's slow to do this. Here we go. These are some interesting statistics, though, that you should take to heart if you're trying to track your ancestors. As late as 1860, less than 20% of the South and only about 12% of Georgia was under cultivation. This is in 1860. Only about 20% of the state was under cultivation. And you'd have been hard pressed to find many Presbyterians. It was still mostly wilderness before the great awakening, religious awakenings of the early 19th century. Fewer than 20% of Georgians were churched at all. So we, we hear these statistics about how frequently the Cherokee are churched as Christians on the eve of their removal, but look at, look at the frequency of religious association in the rest of the state, uh, they probably have exceeded it. <laughs> they probably have exceeded it. Most of the church were Baptist, of course, and uh, they were very hostile toward Methodists and Catholics. I found a record in Augusta where they, they had had a mass protest in Augusta because 
the plan was to build a Methodist church in Augusta, and people were angry about it, uh, mostly Presbyterians and, and Baptists. And they ended up building the church down near Hepzibah, which is about 20 miles south of town. That was the first uh, Methodist church in the state. I think I've already mentioned that, uh, got ahead of myself about moving the whiskey industry into Kentucky, or the bourbon industry as it's called. Well, they disliked, uh, they disliked Presbyterians, uh, excuse me, uh, Methodist in part because they were seen as just an adjunct of the Episcopal Church or the Anglican Church, the State Church of England. Well, who are these uh, Celtic crackers? I've mentioned, I, I read you a piece from uh, uh, McCraney's book, which started all of this. And um, as a boy, I grew up with all kinds of interesting cultural things around me that uh, I now associate with, with Scots Irish neighborhoods. If you ever ridden around and seen a house sitting all by itself on top of a hill with no shrubbery, surrounded by 12 years worth of cutting wood, that's sort of the Scots-Irish mentality, according to uh, McWhiney. I, I'm not sure it's more than a stereotype, but boy, it's a common stereotype, isn't it? Um, Sunday was the day for celebration and merriment and hard drinking in Georgia and throughout the South, for that matter. The settlements were scattered uh, rather than lumped into, into great cities. The only real population centers in Georgia uh, until uh, the 1840s is, is along the uh, fall line from Augusta over to Warrington uh, to Milledgeville and on to the Alabama frontier. It's the old Creek Indian Trail. Of course, all this changes in 1838 when Northwest Georgia becomes open because the Cherokee are removed. Well, let, let me, I, I'm getting a little bit behind because of the but I love this cartoon uh, of people celebrating, and this is supposed to be a Sabbath uh, celebration. Another, f another feature of this uh, culture uh, is a consequence of the geography. Uh, the geography of Georgia that's being settled and cleared to plant cotton and to grow crops and, uh, is also the same land that's being used to raise cattle. I was looking at a census taken in 1850. There were more cows in Georgia than people. Georgia is a cattle state. It has been all along. Mary Musgrove's uh, condition for accepting a position with the Oglethorpe administration in the founding of Georgia was that she could build a cow pen near Savannah and be the marketer for beef cattle into Savannah. She was quite a businesswoman. And here are our two cracker cowboys again. Where they ranged was under the great uh, longleaf pine forest that stretched all the way across uh, uh, below the fall line and somewhat up here as well. But cattle rearing is uh, uh, just infamous almost in Georgia. The first great long, long range cattle drive was in Georgia in, in 1789 out of the mountains up here, all the way to Philadelphia. This suits their lifestyle. Two guys and a block of salt is what you need. You go out in the woods, they eat the wire grass and the other shrubbery they can get at, they find food. If you took a herd of horses out in the woods, they'd starve to death. I, I guess because I'm such a hybrid myself, I always have to re re remind myself of this. I love this fact. Um, you can turn horses loose in the woods and they'll starve to death, but you can turn a pig or a cow loose in the woods and they'll, they'll usually survive. Uh, this is the famous map. It's, uh, it's a modified map uh, that uh, I did the modification on because I wanted you to see and others to see, most of Georgia is simply creek. It's creek. And people cannot sort that out in their minds because we've, we live in an Atlanta-centric world. And this uh, perspective looking out from Atlanta shrinks the rest of the state around it and its history. It does. I have no doubt about it. Um, 
and you say I'm opinionated, I'm retired. <laughs> it's my privilege. But this, is, these, this shows you the land sessions that carry forward the Scots-Irish immigration into Georgia. It's what's sucking people down the wagon road. It's what's propelling people into the frontier. And once these initial counties are settled by these uh, land lotteries, only those people in those counties can draw for the next land lottery. <coughs> you can't show up from North Carolina uh, and, and claim land. You have to be a resident of a county in which there is a drawing. So it's a process. Uh, a lot of land changes hands right there on the spot. As soon as they drew them out of the drum, there's somebody there waiting to buy your land. Or if you want to uh, wait long enough to find out if it has water or it will support cattle or whatever you can do with the land, uh, you might wait and negotiate or you might try to settle it. Uh, people have made different choices all the time about this. Come on. Uh, this is a fun thing to me about the Irish. Uh, I wouldn't quote her as a, a source exactly, but Margaret Mitchell was very uh, acutely aware of the Scots-Irish, and she says uh, she says uh, somewhere in Gone with Wind uh, that Georgia was predominantly Scots-Irish, and there are several Scots-Irish characters uh, in the novel itself. Uh, Perhaps more importantly, there's one family in the story that's Catholic. Do you know the name of the family? O'Hara. Oh, yes. Wow. Boy, what a sharp group. <laughs> and you're asking yourself, how did I miss this? Tara is named for the ancient capital of Ireland. And many of the characters in Gone with the Wind have to do with Catholics in Atlanta uh, in the post-Civil War period, uh, and I, I can't think of his name now, the famous uh, uh, poet of the Confederacy uh, was one of them that she mentions time and again in the story. Uh, by the way, any of you see the sequel to Gone with the Wind? Uh, I, was in Char I was living in Charleston at the time they were making that, and the, this movie company called me up and said, we need to borrow some things to film the movie. And uh, anyway, they had a lot of trouble fil filming the movie. But the movie has Scarlett O'Hara leaving America and going back to Ireland. I think that was a, a, a great choice. And it reinforces this idea. There are a lot of divergent views about the Ulster influence uh, in the South. Uh, one is that the Protestant Scots-Irish reaction to the flood of Irish immigration, green Irish immigration in the 19th century during the potato famine ignited an anti-immigration frenzy and kindred and uh, kindled Scots-Irish awareness. Have you seen the gangs of New York? Go back and watch it now after you've, you've You've heard this uh, little presentation and think, who are these people who are fighting? The old Scots-Irish and English inhabitants of New York, the ones who haven't quite made it, are anxious to defend themselves against this influx of Catholic poverty-stricken res residents from Ireland. The U.S. Army took care of a lot of that. Do you remember toward the end of the movie, uh, the, there's a huge confrontation between the Orangemen and the Greenmen, and they've all armed themselves with cudgels and knives and all kinds of things. And they're, oh, the one guy's a butcher. Remember the guy who's a butcher? And uh, they're about to go to war, and howitzers open up on the city, kaboom, kaboom, kaboom. And uh, the next scene, there are Union soldiers marching through the streets. They've just won the Battle of Gettysburg. You don't necessarily know that. But the reason the riots have erupted in New York, the Irish are angry because they're being drafted into the Union Army. They get off the boat, they put on the blue. 
They go to die. So they're resisting it, and many of them have decided that African Americans ought to blame for this, and they're lynching them in the streets of New York, hanging them from light posts. It's one of the most ignominious uh, sort of consequences of war, uh, of the whole Civil War, really. Um, I'm just hoping to whet your appetite to read some books. Another uh, premise that is circulated is that there still in them there are hills, the Quinney's theory of the persistence of the Celtic culture in the South, and somehow it's gotten migrated into what I believe is the myth of Appalachian culture. I'm not convinced that there is a, a distinct Appalachian culture. I think it's, lar it's largely a nationalistic response to a rapidly changing world. But people have different ideas about that, and I'm not here to quarrel about it. The final one is the one that's made the news, not years ago, not centuries ago, but in the last 15 years or so. And it all started with a book uh, called Born Fighting by a novelist named Jim Webb, who later went on to Congress uh, uh, as a senator, I believe he was from Virginia. He wrote a book called uh, The King's General, which is about General MacArthur, and uh, he got $11 million, supposedly, for writing the book. They were going to make it into a Hollywood movie. It eventually found its way into, into uh, uh, television serialization, and it's been, it's been shown, I think, on Netflix. We, we watched it. It's not a major production, but, you know, what's $11 million to marketers today? Peanuts. But it was big money to him, and he used it, to, he used it in part to write another book, which is called Born Fighting. And he uh, makes an effort to show there's a link between uh, those families that have given militarily to the American uh, military tradition and that they come out of the Scots-Irish uh, tradition. I spent a summer at uh, West Point once, and I, am, I was absolutely convinced when I left there it was a Southern institution. Uh, and. Uh, I think the wars in the Middle East have changed that, but we're getting into another field of, of study there. But at, the t at that time, you think of all the great, who's the most famous military leader in American history? Quick. Robert E. Lee. Robert E. Lee. And even people who live above the Mason-Dixon line say the same thing. He was also commandant at, uh, at West Point for a time. And a real hero who was in the Mexican War and uh, did some darn heroic things there. James Webb's book inspired other writers and one of them was um, the author J.D. Vance who published another bestseller called Hillbilly Elegy. How many of you have read Hillbilly Elegy? This is a book that was on the bestseller list for nearly three years. It's one of the longest running bestsellers ever. It's about a alcohol and drug infested family and uh, the strong women leaders in the family who manage to keep them uh, with their head above water through pride, determination, violence as needed. It's, uh, it's a pretty hairy story. In fact, I wondered if he'd been looking over the fence in my backyard. Um, <laughs> I'm just kidding about that. My parents were God-fearing Baptists, descended, by the way, from the Mercer family that founded the Baptist Church in Georgia. You see why it was a tragedy that I left, <laughs> that I moved over. <laughs> oh, well. They're all passed on now, so we can laugh about it. The question, uh, I guess in, let's see if I can get that back up just for a moment. In the case of Vance's book, he makes the case that America had better wake up 
because these people are the neglected, the disadvantaged. Is that your phone? There's some kind of an alert for some oh, reason. Emergency alert. I've got my phone. I don't have my phone. Hey, did somebody get their phone out and tell us here. I was going to say, well, I used to go to church when they first got these beepers, and we had a church full of doctors. And just as the sermon would start, all the beepers would go off. It's an amber alert. Okay, and you want to? St. Mary's, Georgia. Where? St. Mary's, Georgia. Oh. Uh, during the uh, 2016 campaign, uh, this became an issue, if you'll recall, because uh, the Democratic candidate for president disparaged these uh, sort of uh, forgotten people, people who live in the middle of the country, people who are Protestant, uh, people who uh, have uh, small communities and still go to the movies downtown and, uh, you know, who have sometimes two broken down cars in their yard or the factory is closed and they're in the rust belt. He makes a very strong, uh, or tries to make a very strong connection between the Scots-Irish tradition and this forgotten middle uh, group of Americans. I think he takes it too far. I, I really do. I, I think there are a lot of people who are not Southern and they're not in the military tradition who suffered uh, and uh, who have sort of been cast aside by our society. And I, I'm not sure it does it, a lot of good to awaken our awareness of this on a universal level and make it the main uh, drive of our political system. That's dangerous as hell. Uh, a similar thing happened in Germany in the 1930s where inflation wiped out the middle class uh, through inflation. Uh, uh, rising prices, and it created a very unsettled situation, even for a democratic uh, state. So uh, I, I'm, I'm not trying to make a case one way or the other about current administrations or recent elections. I'm just saying people are awakened to that, and they are awakened to that in England. They're getting out of, they're taking the Brexit route to get out of the European Union. Nationalism is on the rise. And it's being fueled by who? Well, that's the question, isn't it? Who, what is fueling that phenomenon? Is it uh, the rise of the democratic socialist state on the one hand, or is it uh, the uh, prodding and uh, leadership of uh, new politicians on the right? I don't know the answer to that. God, I, 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 I'm relieved I don't know it, honestly. Because then, then I'd be worried all the time. Well, today, what, what, about, what does all this have to do with today? And all this rambling and bumping into historical trends. Um, there is an Ulster Scots uh, Society. In fact, we had the national meeting here on our campus uh, back in 2003, something like that. And uh, it also... Uh, it's currently in the news every day in the European papers. It may not make it into our papers, but here, here's the difficulty. If Great Britain, now out of uh, the uh, European economic market, the border is going up between, the tariff border is going up between Northern Ireland, which is part of Great Britain, and Southern Ireland, the rest of Ireland, which is... Uh, Green Ireland, the Catholic part, with the government in Dublin. And they'd gotten very accustomed to having no border there. When we were there, you just rode right over the border. They didn't even slow down. Uh, of course, I was suspicious when the bus broke down, but that <laughs> turned out to be nothing. Uh, I, I'm just offering an opinion here. No, this is not based on any research. but. 
I, I started out by saying I'd heard a statesman declare that religion was dead in Ireland. I don't think that's true, but I think the Catholic Church has suffered such uh, cat catastrophic uh, uh, difficulties over uh, you know the role of the priest in the community, and the, we saw churches over there that were in fact virtually abandoned. You know, in fact, that's the subject of a lot of British comedy that. Uh, trying to repurpose uh, churches in small communities. Uh, they made a whole series of uh, TV shows that uh, revolve around these themes. Uh, but the, the combination of these two things are dangerous for Ireland, and, and to put it in very you know, simple terms, the rise of nationalism on the one hand and the frustration and anxiety that goes with a, a sharp dip in the economy caused by Brexit could do all kinds of things uh, to the Irish settlement that's been fairly calm and progressive ever since uh, you know the uh, Camp David Accords uh, were done. And Americans have played a great role in, in trying to maintain the peace in Ireland, and we've also bankrolled all the worst causes American citizens, you know, Catholics in Boston, still give money, you know, to radical causes. And um, one of the things that we saw in Ireland that impressed me a great deal, the people of Northern Ireland do not want to be abandoned by the British government. It's their soul and their defense. It's their protection against the, not the rest of Ireland, the rest of Northern Ireland because many people are Catholic and have endured uh, this, a, 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 have experienced this settlement with the, with the uh, Protestant majority in the north. But that's changing. That majority is giving way uh, as people uh, change their denominations and, and also because of the decline in the Catholic Church. All kinds of things are upsetting the situation in Northern Ireland. I'm sure I, I'm not giving you any clarity and the truth is, I don't think there is any clarity at the moment. It's going to be a very difficult situation for months ahead. And what happens when this virus causes our economy to go into a swirl, as uh, their economy to go into a swirl? Interesting. I, we had uh, we had a. Uh, Visitor, we've had a number of people visit here who were um, associated with the Scots Irish, and I have this one personal objection to the Ulster Scots Society, and that is it is so Scottish. The people who came and settled the plantation of Northern Ireland, also came from London, by the way. And those Scots who came were in the main Lowland Scots and not part of that uh, Highland tradition. So it, it's the appropriation of a culture so you can have something to hang on to, you know. A lot of Southerners do this. You know, we appropriate across timelines and across state lines and across national lines. We appropriate other cultures to make ourselves look good. We do it. Oh, Southerners would never do that. But Yankees would never do that either. Right? I guess at the, uh, the question is, does it matter? It matters to the extent that it's best not to express an opinion unless you make some effort to be informed. Uh, my, my, my thinking, uh, you know, travel, reading, it's, it, it evolves all the time about what I see uh, in that uh, Scots-Irish tradition. I'm about 20% Irish and 80% and, uh, English. In, in fact, my, what, they sent me one of those diagrams, you know, of uh, your family tree, and mine looks like a corn stalk. <laughs> um, nobody ever came from anywhere else but England and, and Ireland. What does that mean? 
Does it mean it informs our personality? Does it mean it informs our values? We are Americans. We have been here for not 200 years. We have been here for 400 years. And our culture is deeply steeped in values shared by Native Americans too, and formed on the frontier. Uh, so uh, where is the profit, the cultural and collective profit that is, of strongly identifying with uh, some other national group, when in fact you have never been there or never had any connection with it? Um, it's complicated. It is. It's fun to think about. It's fun to put on the kilt, you know, and go to the Highland Games. Um, but not many people in Northern Ireland did that, and their descendants didn't either. But we drank a lot of whiskey. <laughs> I've, I've overrun you a, a bit, I think, but uh, and I'm sorry about not being able to work the technology, but that's not news to my wife, <laughs> who just joined us and left. The aunt, she must have recognized the Amber Alert. <laughs> there we are again. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. You want to take any questions? Yeah. I will. But uh, open the door so we have some air. Open them both. Turn on the lights.